it's like one of those few things that happen in the history of civilization, right? Like the printing mm-hmm. press or changing from horses to cars. Like it's that big. The and, internet, it's ha- and it's going to have that big of an media. impact. The, in- yeah. Yeah, the internet. And it's like the, the people like your guy that you're saying, right? When the horse, when the horses were the thing and the car came out, that guy is saying, oh yeah, right. Like they're going to be able to, to put a gas station on every corner. Right. And yeah. all the things that they said and look at yeah. it, it's like, there's nobody yeah. riding horses around. Well, I guess I'm it. Insurance dudes are on a mission to escape being handcuffed by our agencies. How? By uncovering the secrets to creating a predictable, consistent, and profitable agency sales machine. I am Craig Kretzinger. I am Jason Feldman. We are agents. We are insurance dudes. Yeah, who, would, who would sit in a room and watch a box with images right. on it? night long you know who would walk around uh, with a box in their say, hand nobody's, n- nobody's gonna stop watching tv to uh to play on their phone all day long you know and yeah, then right. they are like i don't even I, I don't even know why i have a tv sometimes <laughs> like i'll turn yeah. something on on it and then i'll just be working on my phone you know like i don't even really watch the damn thing yeah so but i don't either i don't yeah know. it's like it was like the industrial revolution there was the then there was the computers personal computer yeah. 80s, right? And then and then the next big thing was the internet. It took a little while to catch on. Yeah. So that was like another 20 years before it like really caught on and then it was like social media was like the next level of le- cuz these are all big leverage pieces. Which like human cool. leverage. How can which, we keep people on the dude, internet all the time? You know? Yeah. And that's yeah. what social media did. And no, yeah, so there was like he, all these things took human leverage, which was the ultimate leverage and like multiplied it, yeah. right? Like all these things, but like now that there's internet computers and now artificial intelligence, mm-hmm. dude, that's like, yeah. I mean, it's so much leverage that if you're not looking in that direction, dude, you're going to be crushed. And it's oh, not, it, it's not a maybe like, this is fact. Like it, yeah. it's fact. Like you talk to the guy that owns the world now, the, the dude that, that, um, from NVIDIA, right? Like he yeah. just said, we have so much capacity for the software right? Those hardware infrastructures there, and that'll just keep getting built. You know, they're, yeah. they said they're nowhere near Moore's law, like the end of Moore's law. So it's going to keep doubling, right? So crazy, insane. Yeah. That's uh. so I think that there's going to be this division of, well, it's going to be like, kind of like Wally, you know, with all the people, <laughs> yes, the fat like people, people on the spaceship. Flying. I mean, I, I envision, a. I don't know how long this will take, but I, and I'm, this, this is not an endorsement for me, by any means, but I envision a society where the division of wealth gets so great, but that the the people that own everything, who are going to be the people that utilize and, and harness the tools at the top, it's going to be your your top whatever five percent of people, right? They're going to be so far away from the bottom that they'll they'll that will pass universal base income eventually. They will. You know, I, I believe this. I mean, there's going to be this entire dependent, depressed yeah. little class of people that exist buying and consuming from this group of people that is living this entirely Control. different life, you know, and they act like the division of wealth now is great. Yeah. It's just going to get worse and worse mm. because like you said, 47% of the people don't even know what chat GPT is. So far behind. <laughs> it's, know, like... it's like to not even know what it is. Like, I mean, <laughs> right. I mean, that doesn't make any sense, but, um, it's, bonkers. it's like, it's like Google, man. I still remember the first time I heard of Google, I was in seventh grade social studies. That's how old Google is. I'm 36, you know, not that I'm old, but I'm 36. I was in seventh grade social studies. We were using web crawler and Belinda Nanny, my social studies teacher said, well, you guys should try Google. We had the little computers in the classroom, the like, you know, white box, you know, the old school. And, um, <laughs> We got on, I remember getting on Google and she was telling us like, oh, Google is means a hundred, it's a hundred, a one with a hundred zeros. I still remember this, like conceptually where it's at. And there are kids right now that are in school, guarantee you people, like teachers, there's certain teachers who tell them you should look at what Chad GPT is, you know, Um, you should look at, you look into that and then they're using, and of course, then you get some of the teachers like, oh, you can't use AI to copyright stuff. There's no way around that. Have you seen the apps that kids use to do their math where they take a picture of a complex math scenario and it just does the work? Yeah. Seen this? Like it's like Oh which, you know, man, we got screwed. <laughs> I don't know. Like I had to learn math the quadratic equation. 
Yeah, the, or the, uh, well, you know, Pythagorean theorems and reflective properties and whatever. I don't even know what any of that stuff really is. I know what the Pythagorean theorem is, but I don't think I've ever had to use it. <laughs> right. So, you know, not in insurance anyway. You got to love the school system. Give yeah. you tools that, that you'll never use. Right. They Makes ought to be sense. sitting there teaching you how to leverage chat GPT. Of course, teachers right. who knew that wouldn't be teachers probably. <laughs> Well, yeah, then you, you wouldn't be a good little, uh, you know, slave of the system. That's right, yeah. Yeah, I think it was um, the second Rockefeller, maybe, somebody that went to the Department of Education way back in the day and said, you're not making enough people to work in our factories. And so it was like the, mm -hmm. I, there's, I haven't read like up on this, but I've heard about it before. I think it was period. Carnegie. Maybe it was Andrew Carnegie. And it was like, we need steel mill workers. We need, you know, and you're 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 not creating enough people oh, to dumb yeah. them down. So like the, the curriculum had to change to force them into that type of like prepare them for that role, you know. And so it's like, do you yeah. want your education to be preparing you for a role that you wouldn't choose? <laughs> but that's what it does, yeah. you know. And it really hasn't adapted much at all. So they started putting the school bells, just like the the bells oh, at work. Damn, uh, just grooming. Grooming the Americans in a nice That's little it. row, right? Yeah, in yeah. a row. Yeah, very interesting, well, man. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it'll be. I mean, our industry, you know, it, it's it's kind of funny too because you know we're on the Medicare side, and so it's like it'll impact us in some ways slower than other niches or you know other industries, other age groups, demographics, right? Um, but in other ways, it'll impact negatively. I can, I can see like the scams that are going to, because our generation, the generation that we serve mostly, and we'll do, we do individual health from zero to a hundred, you know, but we'll, we'll do Medicare. We do a little bit of small group. We'll do life. We'll do all that. But we're, our focus has always been me Medicare has been like the, the pillar of what we did. And um, that generation already gets scammed so easily. And now with AI and AI voice and like being able to, mirror your relative's voice and all this we actually have an employee whose sister and she was like 35 or 40 the other day somebody hacked her real estate attorney's email created another email with a one after it so what does this call her joe schmo real estate broker whatever and then they put one at gmail.com and then took the emails that she had and started emailing her clients saying, you know, you haven't sent me your the down payment yet, or you haven't sent me the check yet to see what she, this, the scammer would get. Well, his sister, the guy that works for me, who's like 35 to 40, saw this and then said, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, let me get it to you. And what is it? And they're like, it's 150,000. And then told her to go to this bank and wire. This relatively young person went and wired this scammer 150. Oh my gosh. And, and so I'm like, think, think, about, like think about like oh, this no. 65 plus community, like I right. mean, especially oh, yeah. 70, 75, 80. I mean, they're just getting an AI is going to amplify that. So we'll, we'll see the negative, I think, implications of it before we see it like absolutely decimate the cell size. But it's already. And, and the other thing, too, is like, you know, contacting clients, I feel like is one of the big or contacting prospects is already one of the most difficult things right now, because the threshold for someone to actually answer their phone now is like all time low by a long shot. Right. Yeah. And so if you're trying to do it like archaically right now, like let's say you're not even using automation, you're not even using if then logic automation to get them to They're answer just the phone. Using their, their, they're turning the yeah, they're just too, I mean, it's basically like you're just like sending a carrier pigeon to them if you're not using at least automation. But now with AI, like, I mean, because that bot will sit there and communicate with them 24 hours a yep. day and sound yeah. like a human. I mean, every now and then, like you got, we were talking before, every now and then it'll say something goofy, but it's getting better and better every day because it's actively building its own algorithm yeah. to function so it's not like i have to go in and change it it's changing itself as it has issues you know i might can change certain things to help it along but it's changing itself dude you know? i i tested our voice one that i built and it it did i ran 120 leads through it today we got two quoted from the first run i mean that's yeah. pretty good right i don't know how many answered i didn't I didn't get into that part of it, but my yeah. office manager just came over. He said, we got two out of it so far. And that was yeah. at, after two hours. So it might be something. I, I do think that you got to, one thing this, uh, you know, that 
would probably be my greatest concern being, you know, a distribution company in the insurance space is so far in most niches, direct to consumer enrollment has failed, not completely failed, but most of them have like negative CP, like there's C, not negative CPAs, but CPAs that are higher than their lifetime value, uh, you know, from their clients, right? So, um, car- but carriers play different economics than brokers because they're not dealing with commission, they're dealing with premium. So their CPA could technically be higher than a broker's CPA or an insurance agent CPA. And now you add AI into it. I do believe that there's going to be a lot of companies that are going to evolve in the direct-to-consumer space, you know, both PNC, life, Medicare, health, every every sector of it. So we'll see, you know, how that evolves because it's funny because, like, it seemed like a lot of people were leaving that space. Like, it was, like, especially in PNC, you know, it's, like, it's kind of imploded. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on in that market. There's a lot of stuff going on in every market. But, yeah. um, like, there's – it's like they were starting to say, oh, man, it's just too expensive to do business this way. But now all of a sudden AI is coming along. So, you know, there's going to be startups and private equity pumping into some groups that are going to be trying new things. And at this point, they might be more successful than they were in the past, Mm -hmm. which could be. And that's one of those reasons that I'm talking about these agents that are trying to get in right now. It's like, okay, get in, but you better move quick. Because if you're not, if you you know, I had like several years ago in Medicare, I had a uh, kind of a mint or one of I have several men, I've had a hundred mentors, but this mentor in his space and the, what he was teaching me, he told me this is the land grab. Like, and this was probably eight, nine years ago. It was pretty soon after I got in. He said, this is the land grab. The next 10 years are the land grab in Medicare. And, and the people that don't go and grab their share of the pie are going to really struggle to, you know, persist. Because at some point we're going to plateau on how many people are like that growth factor, of how many people are turning 65 and all that. Um, but I think that's in every niche right now because of AI, like we're in this land grab, go and grab your business, grab your, you know, get your processes in order, all that. Because what will happen, I believe, is there be further and further consolidation? Private equity has a high appetite for people that are doing things. Your algorithm, like your AI and your algorithm and your your automation and your brand, ends up being worth a lot more than you realize because these private equity groups or these publicly traded groups that even carriers will buy that stuff because they it's shiny objects to them. They're like, man, if I could just get that, like it'll be worth way more, and it is worth more to them. Now, sometimes they'll screw it up because they'll come in and buy it and get the founder out of there. And then the founder was the guy that was driving the whole thing. Um, but I'm seeing a lot of them now where they're like with us, you know, we sold 51 percent, but we have 49 percent retained equity. So the concept is like keep the founder involved, engaged on the profit side of it, but control the aspects of it. You know, um, so there's a lot of variables out there right now. It's a crazy, a crazy market in everything, election year, AI, man, it just seems like- There's gonna be some yeah, funny videos. Here. <laughs> yeah, a couple questions. One is, what do you think for that you see on the sales side with all your agents and everything that, that you're working with, what are some of the most successful agents doing today that might be a little different than the yeah. past? I mean, man, so, you know, the, the first ones that come to mind, the, the in, in the Medicare space, the most successful ones right now are finding a very niche, uh, uh, was a niche market, a niche avatar using Facebook ads that speak to that niche avatar messaging wise, getting in front of them in either a webinar educational format or some sort of, you know, quick call to action, getting that, that lead info into a high level system. Like we have ones called GoGuru, but there are many others where people just have their own high level, whatever, communicating quickly, trying to contact them fast. And then when they can't contact them with three contact attempts, it going into that, that pipeline we're talking about of AI and automation, continuing to follow up and just using that lead bank. And then also one of the things they're doing that's that's impactful is treating that lead bank like an asset in itself that I can come through randomly and do broadcast messages to or create new ideas. But most of the, the ones that are having extreme success and, you know, more agents, people that evolve into agencies or FMOs, they're um, they're having a, a, a lot of success in just thinking about rapid niche markets and trying a lot of stuff and see what sticks. Another thing is magnetic marketing, like the Dan Kennedy style magnetic marketing is still work. Mm. Very creative, decent frequency, traditional touches. Like, I mean, I, in the Medicare man, direct mail still works if you don't do it like everybody else. You come up mm. with something, you know, where like we send, we wrote a book 
for Medicare consumers. And we mail that book to every person turning 65 in, in several states with a letter. Then we do a follow-up postcard, a follow-up postcard. And every one of them, we're inviting them to webinars. You know, And then we have that evergreen webinar. And that's working really well. Now, a lot of people would look at what we spend on that and think, well, that's really expensive. But then you look at like the average first year return on ad spend that we're getting on those clients because we're targeting middle to upper middle income. Whereas in Medicare, so many of the people that are going to struggle in the next few years have been targeting low income. And I'm not saying like, you know, all policies have value, but I can't spend very much to get in front of a low income person because they don't buy a lot of other stuff. You know, whereas right. magnetic marketing style campaigns where I'm dealing with people who are, let's say, in retirement, 50,000 to 200,000 income. But I'm, I'm touching them with educational and comedic style quality marketing. When they call in or they go to a webinar and they respond, they'll buy the core Medicare policies from us. They'll buy additional cancer. They'll buy life insurance. And occasionally we have a, a sector in the office where it gets to our financial side and we'll do some annuities and other things so that that lifetime value of that customer on average of that return first year return on ad spend is significant because so i can go spend 400 500 to acquire a customer where other people are trying to acquire a customer at 100 bucks because it's low income and they can't cross sell them anything and they stay on the books eight months but that's like it's like staying on a hamster wheel and when you're in a business like insurance like you got to be chasing the renewal aspect of it so if i can if I can have a first year return on ad spend at all, but then have all that renewal income down the pipeline, that's the ones that are successful. You know, they, they figure out a way to get off the ground enough to where they can spend more money on quality marketing and they trust the process. They don't drop a piece of mail. They don't run an ad right. and then turn it off and wait for the result. They just run it and run it and run it. Consistency and run it. Yeah. over time. Like that's yeah. a long-term yeah. strategy versus the typical agent. I mean, I, I did it forever where I'd buy something, go, ah, oh, we didn't get anything and then freak out. And oh, we, two months later, we close them. Right. And then it's like, maybe we need yeah. to restart. And then yeah, that, yeah. And that's you, the and freaking you, monkey and mind game. Dude, I've, I've done it too, man. Like, it's <laughs> not like it, when I tell somebody to do something and, and then you tell somebody to do something, yeah. it's not like I'm saying I did that every time I'm saying, learn from my mistake. Yes. You know, um, you know, find the budget that you can stick with for a long period of time. Don't go blow your load in month one and then have to sit there and wait. You know what I mean? <laughs> so. A hundred percent. It's like, so, oh, go ahead. No, 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 go for it. I can't remember. What are you most optimistic about in the next year? And, and what mm -hmm. advice would you give other agents? Just like the last thing you said, I mean, the principles are all the same. Yep. It doesn't matter if it's Medicare, PNC, you know, the consistency of buying leads and, and, and like that principle is applicable against any type of business buying <laughs> leads pretty much. Yeah. Um, Preach, my, Mr. Jason. My, my biggest, yeah. um, my, the most exciting thing for our business right now is finding, is, I mean, like what I'm ultimate avatar of who I'm looking for right now. Our, our consumer side is pretty much on autopilot and continues to grow. But our, on the agent side, I'm super excited about finding the strong independent agent that wants to become an actual business. You know, the guy who's mm. figured out how to sell or the gal who's figured out how to sell, they're writing, you know, 150, 200, 300 policies a year. How do I build a team? And I don't mean go and recruit a bunch of people in, into a pyramid. I mean, build an actual team of employees. And I'm not knocking that. We have downline agents too, but I'm like, how do I go and build a business out of this? You know, because the there are different hard parts in business, but in insurance, I, it's, it's got to be, you know, the hardest part has to be just getting off the ground into a consistent momentum. And so yeah. if I can find that individual agent or that really small agency, and then I can help them with our tools and our events scale to the next level. That's what we're good at. You know, I don't, I don't go out there and say like, Hey, I'm, really good at taking, you know, brand new agents, you know, in, I mean, we work with brand new agents, you know, especially if I vet them and think that they have potential, but like, mostly I want to find the agent that's looking to go from strong independent producer to agency owner, um, in the, the life and health Medicare sector. Yeah. It's, it's amazing that you get into this business and they teach you the product, right? It's just like, yeah. here's the product, here's the product, here's how to use the system and, but nothing about business ownership. Right. And like, oh. you, to your point, we all show up here average, right? Like we couldn't do the other stuff. So we come to insurance 
and and it's like oh okay cool it's a you know full opportunity and then we get trained on this narrow little piece that really doesn't help us advance the thing you know and then right. it's like finding the right mentors like it, if you're in your space like finding people like you hopefully people look yeah. to us and, and think the same way you know in the pnc yeah. space because it's like we did it we could help people save a lot of time and a lot of frustration a lot of money yeah. just by listening right Oh yeah, dude. If I at this point, if I was going to get into PNC, I'd be coming to guys like you and be like, "All right, what's the cheat code?" Like you know, and, and the cheat. And look, it's just not like there's a button to push and create a business. Right. But you know, going to somebody and saying, "What do I not do?" <laughs> is almost as valuable yeah, as saying what to do. You know, like where 100%. where have you wasted the most money and time? <laughs> um, because a lot of times the ideas you have are like, "Oh, I'll do it this way, and that would work really well." And then you find out, nope, like, no, well, that that you know, we tried that, or you know, or one of our people tried that. You know, so I tuition. think it's uh, it's yeah, it's tuition, and 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 if I can pay somebody else or a line or work with them in some capacity. Um, I, in, in most cases, especially if you choose a good mentor, I mean, and look, I'm not saying there aren't like some snake oil salesmen and scam artists out in the world selling stuff like that doesn't exist. You know, there's bad, there's recruiters. Uh, most of them are actually your typical old school recruiters. They have zero value add. Um, and, you know, and that's in all the sectors that I've seen in insurance. It's, but if you, if you have, if you find the ones that are really practicing what they preach, that seem cutting edge, that are doing things that other people aren't doing, and you work with them, whatever you spend with them, or you know, if you align with them or whatever, it's nine times out of ten, it's going to save you ten times, a hundred times the money, effort, and energy that you would spend just trying to figure it out yourself. And I've seen it before. I've seen people that are like, "Well, I'm just going to try that myself." And I've done that. I've tried things, and I'm going to try this. And sometimes I did it by necessity because I didn't know of anyone else who was doing it. But if you can find somebody that's doing it, and think the good thing about this era we're in right now is that there are a lot of people out there, you know, in individual niches. You go and find. Like you can go on on social media and different areas and find it. And like if you're somebody that listen, most people that listen to this probably don't feel this way. But you'll see these people are like, oh, if you could, if you're so good at selling insurance, why are you selling insurance in, instead of doing this content towards agents? But that's horseshit. Like <laughs> I do. First of all, I do the content towards agents because it's fun. Yeah. It breaks. Amen. Yeah. Of it. just doing it. Outside. And I do. You come to my office right over here. Guess what? All freaking day they're doing talking to Medicare beneficiaries, right? They're, that's what we do. It's like 50% of all of our revenue in this big operation is coming from the direct-to-consumer side. Thing. The, a- from the, the agent thing. side has been fun and it's growing and I would like to do that. But that's almost like I had to graduate out of the hell. Even some of my salespeople, eventually it's like I, now I have another path because it's grueling to sit there and do that part of it forever. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to keep that operation going. But then there's this graduatory phase where some of those people then come over to marketing or they come over to agent support or recruiting or something like that. And it's it can be more rewarding to tell somebody that I'm going to keep them on the direct to consumer sales channel as a full role, as a top producer forever. Rough. Might make them think, I don't know if I can do this forever. <laughs> yes, it's more money than I've ever made in my life, but it's, it's rough, you know, and yeah. you got to do it while you got to do it. But once you see another way, it's like, okay. And that's what I want to show people is like, Hey, let me show you how to do the hard work to build the engine and then use that mm. engine to fuel other aspects and other avenues. You know, yeah. um, Justin, we have to cut it off here, but I would like to ask, can we bring you back? Because this is freaking awesome. We'd love to have you back on, maybe do a part two at some point cool. and uh, keep it going. Mr. Jason has yeah, to run man. his important meeting somewhere. And uh, yeah, so let's do it. Hey, I'll be back for sure, guys. I really appreciate you guys having me. And everybody that's listening should definitely subscribe to and follow the insurance dudes because they're putting out great content. Where can they find you, Mr. Brock? Um, I would prefer Instagram at the Justin Brock or YouTube, uh, youtube.com slash Justin Brock. Boom. Love it, man. Love seeing other people in the industry just killing it. So following you has been uh, so much fun over the years. Thank you guys so much. Likewise. Good stuff, man. Thank you.